Destination Freedom. Destination Freedom, dramatizations of the great democratic traditions of the Negro people, is brought to you by station WMAQ as a part of the pageant of history and of America's own Destination Freedom. The men and women who laid the foundations for the great civic and industrial organizations of the West have always been recognized as having the true spirit of American pioneers. Among these is one Texan whose monument was made not on ranches or in the gold mines, but in the world of business. He was William Nickerson, Jr., founder of the Golden State Life Insurance Company. In a chapter entitled, Mr. Jericho Adjusts a Claim, we bring you the Nickerson Saga. Yes, yes, Chief. I know the souls have to be collected on time. I'm going right now. I'm gonna lay down my sword and shield down by the riverside. Down by... Oh, 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 all right, Chief. All right, I'm, I'm on my way. Just stopping to look up our policyholder's address, that's all. No, Chief. <laughs> He's not going to run away. Now, have any of our policyholders ever gotten away from me? Now, be fair, Chief. Be fair. I'm going. I'm going. He never gives me a second's rest. Always on the job. Go here, go there. One of these days, I'm quitting. Now, 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 you know I was only fooling, Chief. Just <laughs> talking to myself. I'm going to Mr. Nickerson's house. I'm going. Sure. Sure, I like my job. I've got the most secure, permanent job in the world. And the chief sure won't stand for any dilly-dallying. But then, I don't blame him. The company can't afford it. Why, no, chief. You mean they're listening to us right now? Talk to them? Me? Yes, Chief. <clears throat> oh, uh, good morning. My name is Jericho. Now, I'm not calling on you today. Not today. But I want to tell you about this trip so you'll see how efficiently we collect souls. After all, my company is the most prosperous in the universe. Why, the collection routes of some of our agents fetch around the globe. We've never had a policyholder who didn't pay his premiums. You see, I work for the Judgment Day Life Insurance Company. Well, as I've said, I'm Mr. Jericho, special claims adjuster of the Judgment Day Insurance Company. I operate this way. Whenever I call on you, I... Just find your door and knock. Uh, say, uh, say, mister, are you looking for Mr. Nickerson? I am, madam. Well, Mr. Nickerson's very ill, and they're not letting anyone in today. Is that so? Madam, I think the door will open for me. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Well, for last sake. Perfectly to see that. Oh, <laughs> yes, I usually walk in this way. Good evening. Are you looking for me? Mr. Nickerson, I presume? William Nickerson, Jr.? And you? Special Claims Adjuster Jericho of Judgment Day Life Insurance Company. Care to see my credentials? Certainly would, sir. Uh -huh. yeah. Everything's in order, Mr. Jericho. Proceed. Good. Now, I have here your policy, which is about to mature, and as stated, is to be paid in full if you're truly the person to whom it was made out, and if the premiums have been paid up to date without default, and if we have Mr. a record... Mr. Jericho, I know the requirements. Remember, I'm in the insurance business myself. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Of course. 
I'm simply required to check each policy before paying in full. Here. Now, as you see, we have... Uh, is there something wrong? Well, no, I, I don't understand this. What is it? Mm, I knew the front office was rushing me. I knew it. Look at this. Your policy is not scheduled to fall due until ten years from now. Is that right? Precisely. Well, every company makes mistakes. Even Judgment Day can come too soon, I suppose. I'll be going now. Uh, if you live a normal life, rest often and work moderately, I won't be due to call on you until 1955, ten years from today. Good day, Mr. Nickerson. Uh, Mr. Jericho. Yes? Suppose I decide not to change my way of living, go on as I've been going. What do you mean? Well, like tonight. My doctor advised me to stay in, but I have a speaking engagement at a church near Central Avenue. I think I'll go anyway. Would that bring me closer to completing my policy with Judgment Day? <laughs> Well, I'll have to examine your policy carefully, Mr. Nickerson, to say just exactly what that'll mean. Please do, before I decide. You mind if I draw up a chair to this table, Mr. Nickerson? Please do. Thank you, thank you. Won't take a minute to look over your life's policy? Mm-hmm. Now, let me see. Check the time it was issued. That was 1879. Mm -hmm. The place, San Jacinto County, Texas. And the agent of my company who sold you this life policy was... Say, Will. Oh, Will, are you ready? He was one William Nickerson, Sr., your father in partnership with one Emma Nickerson, your mother. They raised you until you were a lean farm boy who washed his face in rainwater one May day to go to the county fair. Well, hurry, Will. You'll miss the corn chuck and contest. Come on, your face is clean now. All right, all right, Dad. Is Jerry ready? <laughs> Everybody's ready, Sip. Right. You hop on. Hey, get up now, Jerry. Get up. Come on. Jerry. It was on this day that you, William Nickerson, Jr., went off with your father to the annual county fair where the farmers of ten counties gathered for the festivities. And there you began to learn the value of your life's premiums. And now we're going to see how much you're worth, Will, and see what kind of working man you are for. We uh, sent you off to college. We got bigger you can't hardly lose. You know, Dad? No, you've got insurance gets loosened. Are you practice? <laughs> oh, no. Attention, please, all corn chuckers up here, attention. Yeah, hold it, boy, hold it. Here it is. Attention, corn chuckers. Come one, come all, you corn chuckers, to the corn chuckers hall. The greatest corn chucking contest in history is about to begin. Step up and line up behind these bushel baskets. Now, step up. Yeah, go on, go on up with it. All right, all right, dear, all right. As previously announced, first prize will go to the farmer who finishes his basket first. First prize, foremanship over the corn chuckers at Sheriff Hadley's ranch during the season. Second and third prizes, round trip to the gold country, California, donated by Millbury State Coach Line. Now, folks, without further ado, corn chuckers, are you ready? Good, good. Now, I'll shoot off my gun and sing along on Old Susanna. I won't stop until some corn chucker yells out that his basket's full. Understood? All right, here I go. yee -hoo! I had a dream the other night when everything was still. I dreamed it all today in the country. You dug into your bushel basket and wiped off the shucks with one sweep of a hand. And your lean fingers cleaned away the silk so fast that before the referee could finish his song... I'm finished! I'm finished! If, well, I'm what finished. That, you, what do you say there, son? I, I cleaned the basket. Here. Well, that's mighty quick. Uh, inspectors, what do you say to this? He's got him clean as cucumbers. He's the winner, all right. Yeah. <laughs> you did all right, boy. Now, don't be bashful. You step up and meet the sheriff. Uh, just a minute, son. Yes, sir? Will you and your dad step down this way over here with not so much noise? Sure, sure. What, what is it? I don't think you'll be able to take that first prize. Oh, but my boy won it. In the way he won and the way he lost. How'd he lose? By being colored. Sheriff Hadley says he won't allow colored boys foreman over his white crew. You can't have first prize. Maybe second. Uh, uh, referee, uh, just a minute before you commit that second prize. Yeah. Can I have your ear here? Well, just a minute. Yeah. You don't say so. Did Middlebury say that? Yes, he said that. Well, um, now about that second prize, son. Uh, yes? 
Milbury says his coaches carry only white past. Now, see here. I know what you're going to say, Farmer, but that's the way they give it to me. They would have told you in front, only they didn't expect you'd win. It was a contest only for white winners. And that's it. Of all the ways to cheat a man out of winning, white supremacy is the worst. You said my practicing had insured me against losing. It did. But you didn't have anything to insure you against race prejudice. That's the kind of insurance you got to find someday. Premiums on prejudice are too high to pay. Come on. Maybe we'll make enough money from this year's crops to pay your way through college. Education's kind of insurance, too. Mm-hmm. Oh, yes. I see here in your premium book that one of my company's discredited agents, race discrimination, was working that route. I see here how he collected from you, William Nickerson, early, very early, and kept collecting. Even when you'd gotten into Bishop College in Prairie View, when you taught night school, when you went to a Houston insurance company for work, a cigar, teacher? No, sir, Mr. Hammond, don't you know. <laughs> well, so you're that school teacher I've been hearing about, huh? Supposed to have a head on your shoulders. What do you know about the insurance business? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> it's truthful, anyhow. Well, I'll tell you now. I'll send you out a few times. After that, if you can build your own, you're in. Advance with your ability. Now was the time, William Nickerson, when you were introduced into a world of mortality tables, compilation rates, plans to protect men against the hazards of life, of policyholders whose premiums were high and whose incomes were low. <laughs> you went on the rounds of the county, walked with long strides from one end of your collection's route to the other. And one evening, you talked to a farmer. Will that policy pay off if I should die unexpected like it covers everything. Even an election? That ought to be pretty safe. Uh, it ought to be, but... I'll take out one of your policies. Uh, will it be on me by the time of the election? If you keep up the premiums. Mm, good. Uh, be sure to come around and uh, collect regular between now and the primaries, will you? I want to be well covered for those elections. Well covered. And so you insured the farmer with a life policy and covered the members of the Farmers' Voters Committee, too, and walked the five miles outside Houston every week to collect the premiums. You added more farmers to your route and eventually bought a horse and buggy so you could keep up with the farmers. And on Election Day, you were making your rounds to collect policy premiums. Say, you going into town, insurance man? Sure, hop on. Up there, man. Up there, boy. Where do you want me to drop you? <laughs> you know what day this is, don't you, Mr. Nickerson? Elections. Take me into town. Some folks been telling me it's real dangerous to try to vote in the Texas primary. They've been telling me that all my life. But this time, me and some of the farmers are going to start it. <laughs> now, drive like you were taking me to a fair, not a funeral. After all, I'm well covered by your policy, ain't I? You, William Nickerson, the insurance man, finished your collections route and wheeled the buggy into Houston and down Marble Street to the voting booths. Whoa, oh, whoa, well, that's, that's a place over there. I see some of the men from my voters' league waiting for me. Yes, but there's another group over there with guns. You sure you want to go? It's a risk you've got to take if you want something bad enough. It's time we had equal voice in choosing those who run the county. The right to vote's about the only insurance for equal rights. I'll risk it. Don't bother waiting for me. But like a good policyholder, you waited while the farmer walked toward the voting booth. Saw him move ahead. Saw men reaching for him. Saw the other farmers coming in to help him. Heard the shots. You saw the farmer stumble in the dust. Saw the crowd gather. Heard the shouts. Wheeled your horse down the streets. Pushed ahead over men who grappled for your reins. Pushed ahead until your horse and wagon were clear and rolling down the streets. Have a cigar, Dickerson. 
Let me study your nerves. I, I saw in the papers what happened at the elections yesterday. One of your policyholders got killed. I know. You should have warned the office. Nickerson, I'm going to give you a word of advice. You've got the makings of an ace insurance man. But you've got to learn how to evaluate your clients better. How? Oh, there's the usual risks involved in ordinary clients. Those risks my actuaries can calculate to the final degree. But in the cases of some of these Negroes you've been writing up... Yes? Now, well, they have hazards that are difficult to calculate. What are you talking about? The hazard of race discrimination. Shortens life. Statistics prove it. There's the hazards of violence for those who try to break segregation, and then there's the everyday hazard they face of, of not being able to get jobs like our other clients. I know about that. Oh, you see what I'm talking about? Yeah, you're level-headed. College man, be careful of those who seem too risky. I see. You know, we could cut down on the risks of discrimination by hiring Negro workers. Oh, now listen here. Well, that's the way it is. To deny a man a job is as bad as denying him the vote. The right to work is the right to live. If you open your doors and practice democracy yourself, help lower the living risks of Negroes. Eggerson, I'm afraid you don't understand. Suppose you go back to your collections, leave me to my own business. All right. But I don't think I'll bring you any more policyholders. Huh. People need insurance. This is the only company that'll take them. I'll find a company that won't add to the risks of its policyholders if I have to build one myself. That was a promise you meant to keep. So you went about Houston, got together with men you knew and trusted. Grisby, Perkins, Green, men who knew and trusted you. And together you planned a company. Gentlemen, gentlemen. I propose that we unite and organize a new insurance company. Stake everything we have at it until it's on solid ground. And then open it to all men, all creeds and colors. And fight to decrease the risk and hazard of living and not increase them. Good. I agree with that. Your proposal was accepted, and you settled down in the town of Houston, saw the business thrive, settled back inside the community, grew with the years until you were considered old and safe, a man of the town with eight children, a man who had no business on that June day of 1921 trying to register to vote. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Nickerson, you shouldn't be coming into the places where you know you're unwelcome. <laughs> it's a long time since we've had a chance to get together. You did all right in that insurance business. In fact, forced me to go into politics. Well, you did me a favor. This is much better. Then will you do me the favor of registering me to vote? <laughs> Yeah, you were able to crack through the insurance business, Nickerson, but I don't believe you're going to vote in these elections. This is one thing that hasn't changed in 20 years. They say, boys, escort the insurance man to the door, please. You went home to your wife, Bertha, and your children, and to them unfolded your plan to form a voters' committee. You went to the county courthouse to register every registration day. Again and again you were refused. From the registration office, you took your case to the courtroom. Well, I don't know that this is any different than other cases. The court rules against plaintiff William Nickerson and rules that the county officials acted in illegal right to deny registration to Negroes. Does that settle it, Nickerson? No, it doesn't, Your Honor. Now, you see here, the court's decided. That's your opinion, Your Honor. But is there any law against me seeking the opinions of a higher court? What are you talking about? Are you going to make more trouble on this thing? From the lower court, you went to the appellate court and lost. And then you took your fight for the right to vote to the federal court, and the Houston city officials became uneasy. Now, now, boys. Easy, easy now. I know how to handle this, William Nickerson. He's a troublemaker. Oh, he's practical. A man with a big family. And before we get to Klan to uh, 
persuade him. <laughs> Suppose you let me go up and have a talk with him. After all, maybe I can show him the easy way. All right, boys? And if not, get the clan to move on the building from Maple Street. I'll give him the easy way out first. <laughs> Got a fine house here, Nickerson. I wouldn't like to see it destroyed or anyone get hurt for old times' sakes. What do you want me to do? Oh, to put it frankly, we want you to call off these voting suits in court. Can't you see? You're doing well in Houston. You're practically free, practically got everything you need. Why push for these voting rights? Being practically free is not being free. You're an insurance man, just as I am. You know something about risks. I like to play it the insurance way. The more policyholders, the better the benefits. I'll go on with the court fight. <laughs> stubborn. I always was stubborn. You know the risks of being a Negro, where there's race discrimination. I don't think you will survive the hazard, Nickerson. And, policyholder Nickerson, in the next few days, your policy and my Judgment Day life insurance company almost fell due. They're coming down the street now. Will, what do we do? Our neighbors are armed and ready, Bertha. They won't get far. Mobs don't run into gunfire willingly. Now, keep down. Keep down and watch the children. Watch the children. <laughs> They didn't stop. The shots kept coming and came every night until one pitch-black night a neighbor crawled down the streets and pounded on the door. Nickerson. Where's Nickerson? Here. Here, Johnson. What is it? You've got to get out of here. But we're holding them off. It's not just us. It's our families. We can't protect them all. I know how hard you fought for this. Believe me, the fight will go on until there's equal voting for everyone. But the men have decided that it's best that you left. For where? California. My home is here. You can make a home there, too. The company will be in touch with you, but it's only death for you here. We've arranged so you can get out. Your family can come, too. Can you get ready now? You got ready, and they helped you escape to the Golden State. You built a home in Los Angeles, got to know the people, and again were organizing a new life when a telegram came. Bertha read it. It, it says here, Will, that, that your company is canceling its California charter, that it's unable to operate in this state. They wish you the best of luck. You're on your own again. William Nickerson, Jr., on your own again. You took the telegram, held it outstretched in your firm fingers, reread it, went outside and called on two of your friends, Houston and Beavers. If we want to work for another insurance company, we've yeah. got to build one again. That's right. Houston knew one of the best appraisers and organizers in the state. Suppose we go up to San Francisco, consult okay. the best lawyer hmm? to learn just how to go about setting up an insurance company. Agreed? It's a good yeah, idea, yeah. Good, yeah. Hey, gentlemen, gentlemen, I'm afraid coming up here was a waste of time. Uh, you see, the minimum requirement for establishing a company is $250,000. $250, now, I've consulted all the legal books on the subject, and that's the absolute minimum, $250,000. Well, that's all. Well, good day, gentlemen. Your hearts ached with despair, and you walked aimlessly down the hallways, ready to forget about the company. It was you, William Nickerson, who got an idea. Wait. Wait a minute, boys. I want to stop in this bookstore here. Uh, what can I do for you, gentlemen? I'd like to buy a set of law books. What type, sir? Well, a set where I could get uh, good information on state requirements for business establishments. Mm -hmm. Well, I have a set here for twenty-seven fifty. I'll take it. Uh, Thanks. No need to wrap them. I'll just carry them with me. You took the heavy books home, set them on a table, and closed the door. And night after night, you looked for a law that would allow you to set up your insurance company. 
Houston, Beavers. Look, I have found a way. Here. Here's a statute that's called an assessment law. This law provides for a $15,000 guarantee fund and 500 applicants for insurance to start a company. You see? Now, we've got to get started on raising that money. We'll put everything we've got in it, and for the rest, we'll go out and dig for it. We've got to go faster, men. Faster. Our competitors know we're working to set up a company. They've helped pass a law that triples the requirements. If we don't have our chart in two weeks, we're through. May 1925. Your application for a charter for a new insurance company, Golden State Mutual, has been accepted. You may proceed with the establishment of your company. <laughs> yes, it's all recorded in your policy with Judgment Day Life Insurance, Mr. Nickerson. Your risks and your premiums, your driving, your building, until the company stood as one of the strongest in the country. With policyholders in the hundreds of thousands, assets in the millions. And still you have not found peace. Your goal now is a fair employment law for California and the nation. Now, Will, where do you think you're going? Stay home, young man. Never mind. Never mind, Bertha. I'm on the state's committee to get a fair employment practices law passed in California. We're meeting tonight. But you're tired and it's raining. Will, you ought to now, take that... Now, 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 Bertha. <laughs> we faced rougher times in this in Texas to get the right to vote. A little California rain's not worth the risk of losing fair employment practices. How many times have you said that to your wife as you did tonight before I had to pay my call? Then gone out and come back, but to go out again and again, you could have stayed inside. As I must advise you to do tonight. You must. As you see, I've checked through your life's policy, and I see why Judgment Day Life Insurance Company expected you to uh, collect your benefits before your time was up. You're still going around California demanding a fair employment practices law? Yes. You see, my policy hasn't changed since I found I couldn't get my first job because I had no insurance against discrimination and race prejudice. I provided people with one kind of insurance. But I want to see that all people are insured against bigotry and prejudice. Fair employment's the best insurance I know of for that. I'm going to make that speech tonight. Each word I speak that advances the cause of human equality is like reducing the premiums people have to pay to live. Peace and equality for all peoples, still the policy I'd like to sell. Well, good night, Mr. Jericho. I'll leave you to adjust that policy. Good night, William Nickerson. Yes, Chief. He just went downstairs and out into the rain. His policy? It was all quite in order. Premiums paid in full. The benefits are long overdue. Yes, Chief, I'll sign it. Adjust to Jericho, Judgment Day Life Insurance Company, April 1945. He was one of Judgment Day's best clients, Chief. You have just heard Destination Freedom's dramatization of Mr. Jericho Adjusts the Claim, the saga of Texas William Nickerson, Jr. Destination Freedom is written by Richard Durham and produced by John Cowan. The role of William Nickerson, Jr. was played by Fred Pinkard, and George Kluge was Mr. Jericho. Others in the cast were Janice Kingslow, Jack Lester, Donald Gallagher, and Stan Gordon. The special music was composed by Emil Soderstrom and played by Mary Sinclair and Jose Bethencourt. Our engineer was Gary DeVlieg. Sound effects were by Cliff Mueller. This is Charles Chan inviting you to be with us next Sunday for Destination Freedom. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.